Um, some people are able to remember every appointment that's on their calendar. Uh, everything that they have to do, everything that they've always done before as a routine, and even just those one-time things. Uh, some people don't have good memories and are not able to remember all those kinds of things. Somebody tells you something and it's just gone. And if we don't write it down, then we're never going to do it. We all have different you know, levels of, uh, of memories about how, we're, how well we're able to remember things. So how about you? When it comes to trying to remember something that you have to do, what is your way, what's your secret to how you remind yourself to do something? Uh, are you a, a, a paper and pencil kind of person? Are you a calendar person? Are you an electronic device sort of person? Uh, think about what you are and then turn to somebody or a couple people or get up and run across the room, however you choose, and tell them how do you remind yourself to do something. Got it? Okay, go ahead, find somebody and tell them how do you remember to do something. Uh, we've all heard that if we're going to remember something, that we're supposed to tie a little string around our finger, right? Traditionally speaking. Uh, yeah, that's on there. It's not color. It's not color. I know it's faded, so just imagine that that is in color, I guess, right? All right. So traditionally, people have thought that this comes from an old Egyptian custom, and they thought that if you tie a string around your finger, you would, you would be tying the thought inside your body so it couldn't escape through your fingers. You were tying it in there, perhaps. Uh, I prefer the biblical connection to this whole thing, which comes from Numbers. Uh, here it is. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord. The tassels will help you remember that you must obey all my commands and be holy to your God. Uh, this is actually the origin of the prayer shawl, the Jewish prayer shawl. It has the blue ribbons and tassels and everything. So um, that might be the connection to or the origin of, the, of the, the string around your finger. But I guess we all need reminders about things. And when it comes to growing in our faith, we all definitely need reminders. Uh, it's surely not the case that we've all you know, arrived, that we're perfect in relationships with God, that we're all just, we're done. We've got nothing left to do. We have nowhere else to grow. We definitely have not done that. Um, you know, we oftentimes have ever across, we, we've talked for a while about our faith in terms of stepping in. Like we, we need to step into a relationship with Christ. We need to step into new seasons or new things in our faith or new opportunities. We, we step in. Now, if we went along with the idea that we have already arrived, that, that we're there, we don't have anything left to do in a relationship with God, instead of saying, we'll step into a relationship, we might say, well, you're already in. You're in. But we're not in. We need to keep stepping in to a relationship with Christ. And if we need to do that, um, then we need some help in being able to do that. In fact, that's really why River Cross Church exists. We exist to remind each other, to help each other step into relationships, deeper relationships, to go further, to grow, to keep going with a relationship with Christ. And in order to do that, we need reminders. If the book of Joshua is about anything, it's about the ways that God reminds us to step into our faith. The entire book is really about people stepping into their faith, and there's some specific ways that it talks about being reminded to step into our faith. So we're going to look at a section in Joshua, but in order to do that, we need to kind of step back for a minute just to get the context of where this sits. Uh, if we don't, it won't make any sense. So Joshua overall, if we step back and look at Joshua, the whole book is you know, about the people of God coming into the promised land. So for 500 years, God has been promising, that will be your land someday, you're going to get there, 
but just not yet. It's coming, so just wait for it. It's, it's promised. And then the last 40 years before the book of Joshua events happen, that's really the intense time of it's really coming. It's coming soon. Just wait for it. You're getting there. And it's really close. And so when, when the people of God step into that physical promised land, I mean, they are living this huge moment in history. It's the thing that all of their ancestors have hoped for forever. And they are finally getting to witness this and experience this and actually do this. So that, coming into the promised land, that's the first half of the book of Joshua. That is, that's all that happens. And it's a big high time. I mean, it's an exciting time. It's filled with miracles and it's filled with all sorts of cool things that happen, along with a few setbacks here and there at the beginning of Joshua. But all in all, overall, it is a, it is a high, exciting time for the people to enter the land. Well, then halfway through the book, a lot of things kind of change. And at that halfway point, which we started to look at last week, there's this whole section about, well, they finally gone into the land. Now they're, now they're spreading out and they're really living there. They're inhabiting. They're moving into this land. And this is the section that uh, most of us don't read. Um, and for good reason. I don't read it often either because it is just not exciting. You know, it's about lists and names and places and boundaries and borders and rulers and it just doesn't make a lot of sense because we don't live in that area. So the mention of all those things, list after list, line after line, page after page, it just, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but that section is important because it talks about those people stepping into that land and the places that God is leading all of those people. So the section that we are looking at today comes right at the end of that section about everybody coming into the land. And the section basically describes this map. Um, I wish you could see it better and brighter, but this is the uh, land that the 12 tribes of Israel inherited from God. It's all divided up among all the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Sounds exciting to us, right? Just you wait. The 12 tribes of Israel come from, we need a little background, it comes from the descendants that come from Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. When Jacob has 12 sons, it kind of is the beginning of this 12 tribes of Israel. But it's not quite that simple. Joseph, the youngest of the 12 sons, he is not one of the 12 tribes of Israel. He has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so we have 11 sons of Jacob and two grandsons of Jacob. And if we do our simple math that we're able to do, what does that add up to? 13. But wait a minute. We don't have 13 tribes of Israel. We have 12 tribes of Israel. So... What is going on? You've been burning to answer this question, haven't you? <laughs> Ever since you woke up. Yes, you've been burning. Okay, here we go. When the promised land was divided up, it went to 10 of the sons of Jacob. Not 11, not 12, but 10. And then it went to those two grandsons, the two sons of Joseph, those two grandsons. So 10 plus 2 equals 12. They got all this land. It was all divided up to them. They got to move into the land. They got to put signs in their yards saying, you know, this is the land of Asher and this is the land of Gad and the family of Issachar lives here. And so they all had their land and they all moved in. I mean, it was theirs. God gave it to them. Joshua said, go there. This is your space. Here's the boundaries. And they moved in. But who got left out? Levi. Levi got left out. What's up with that? Why didn't Levi get any land? I mean, it's kind of like he's pushed out. He's one of the sons. He's supposed to be one of the tribes, one of the clans. So why does Levi not get land? That's an important issue. So here's what Joshua 21 says about Levi. Then the leaders of the tribe of Levi came to consult with Eleazar the priest, Joshua son of Nun, and the leaders of all the tribes of Israel. 
They came to them at Shiloh, it's an important city in the land of Canaan, and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us towns to live in and pasture lands for our livestock. So by the command of the Lord, the people of Israel gave the Levites the following towns and pasture lands out of their own grants of land. The total number of towns and pasture lands within Israelite territory given to the Levites came to 48. Every one of these towns had pasture lands surrounding it. Did you know you were going to do math today at church? So what happens with Levi? What happens with the people of Levi? They get some land, and specifically what they get is they get something a little different. They get land from each of the 12 tribes. So all these people kind of give a little section of each of theirs to Levi. And specifically what they get is they get a town here and a town there and a town here, and then they get the pasture land around that town, but that's really all they get. It's, uh, there's another place where it describes that they get like a quarter mile of pasture land around the town. So, you know, back on our map, when you know, these other tribes got this huge, spacious land, miles and miles, the Levites get these little carve-outs, these little cities, you know, here and there. Uh, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think this picture is worth 37 verses that I'm sparing you from the middle of that chapter where it just describes all these cities and all these places and boundaries. So, this is the map of the 12 tribes. Now, here's what the Levites get. Okay, the stars represent all the different cities, 48 cities in all, where the Levites get their land. Now, your turn. What do you notice? What sticks out to you? What do you notice about these places? They're spread out. There's one in each. They're everywhere. Yes. That's the point. Because the Levites have a different kind of job than all the other tribes of Israel. The other tribes of Israel, their job is to inhabit the land. They go, they take control, they, they secure it, that's the space. They're saying, this is God's land. But the Levites, that's not their job. God gave them a different job. We find that job in Deuteronomy. Here's a short description of the Levites. Moses said this to the Lord about the tribe of Levi. The Levites obeyed your word and guarded your covenant. They were more loyal to you than to their own parents. They teach your regulations to Jacob. They give your instructions to Israel. They present incense before you and offer whole burnt offerings on the altar. Okay, let's translate this. What does this mean? It means they're obedient people. It means they worship and they provide for everybody's worship. It means they guard the covenant. God's relationship with us is really important and they do whatever they can to ensure that everybody can have a relationship with God. They're connecting with people and teaching people about this. They're serving people. It, it's actually kind of interesting. Translate that into River Cross Church language, and they are stepping in to worship, connect, and serve. Wow. It's pretty cool. The Levites do this. <laughs> but imagine for a second that you were one of those tribes of Israel, and you were given your land, you went out 50 miles away, and you went into your land, you inhabited it, it was all yours. Imagine that you're one of these tribes, you're living the promise that God gave you, you're finally there in this becoming peaceful setting and you finally get there and you build a house, you plant crops, you settle in the land, how easy is it to say, thank you God, you did that, but the promise is done. You know, the promise is now past tense. It's already happened and I'm in the land. I'm good. It's easy to think, I don't need a whole lot more. I don't need to cry out to God like I did in my crisis. I don't need to yell for God, help me, help me all the time, because I don't need a lot of help. I'm good. That's when God sent the Levites. God sent the Levites throughout the land, throughout the people, to remind them what a relationship with God is, why they need to have it, how to worship, how to live in this relationship with God. God provided reminders, God sent reminders, God built in reminders to the people so that they would not forget how incredibly important a relationship with God is. 
So who are your Levites? Who are the people in your life that are those reminders that tell you your relationship with God is important? Don't let it go. Keep it going. What are you doing to keep it strong? Who are those Levites in your life who ask those questions, who encourage you, who are your champions, who remind you of that? There was a lot of Leviting going on, if that's a word, um, over the last year. I love the Leviting that was happening uh, when our students went through the confirmation uh, uh, sessions that we had in the winter and spring. I mean, the mentors that came alongside students and were Levites to them, encouraged them to learn and grow and understand what a relationship with God is like. Uh, that's happening at the Bible Club every Monday. There are leaders and mentors who are talking with kids. Uh, it is so cool to see that encouragement about keeping a relationship with God at the forefront of us. It's happening among, you know, those of you that are meeting with other people throughout the week or the weeks or the months, when you get together as a Bible study group or a small group of some kind, and you're talking about this, you are Levites to each other, helping each other understand what is this and, and grapple with how do I do a relationship with God now? And what does that look like now? And there are all kinds of settings where we're doing this. But also, who are you a Levite to? Who am I a Levite to? Who are we encouraging? Because, you know, as, as the kids talked about, we all have spiritual gifts. God has given each one of us gifts to be able to be used to build up Jesus' body. Which means, how do we encourage each other? How do we grow faith in each other? How are we a Levite to settle in the land of somebody else and to say, I'm here to encourage your faith? How are we Levites to our households and our church? and our friends, and people even beyond their normal circles. How are we Levites to people? God sent these reminders into people to ensure that we keep a relationship with Him strong. How are we doing the same thing so that our relationship with God stays strong? Let's pray.